So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and focus. Uh, we heard about civil uh, search warrants when private parties are interested in obtaining our personal information. And I'm going to switch gears a bit to talk about what happens when it's law enforcement or the state that wants to access our personal information. Uh, for reasons I can't explain, this has become a huge area of interest for me. I don't encourage it. It's the easiest way to torture yourself into a permanent state of paranoia, uh, to learn about all of the creepy ways that the government can find out information about your deepest, darkest secrets. Uh, once you're into the realm of the state seeking access to your personal information, all of the litigation and all of the jurisprudence focuses on uh, and is centered around Section 8 of the Charter, because we all have a constitutional right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. And so that's where all of the uh, case law and all of the uh, legal action has been. There have been a whole series of cases coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada talking about Section 8 of the Charter in the digital privacy context in particular, uh, some of which are, are listed on there, which makes it nice because you can become an expert in the subject area uh, just by reading those cases uh, or by buying this infamous book that Ted was talking about. <laughs> Uh, I, I put a graphic up there just to illustrate how, you know, where the hottest issues are going to be in the next few years in this area. And that is, you know, you can't function these days in modern society without entrusting your personal information to third-party service providers, to private organizations and businesses that are offering us all sorts of services. And so we entrust them with our confidential information. That then makes them targets. Uh, for all sorts of requests from law enforcement who are conducting criminal, quasi-criminal regulatory investigations. Uh, Google, you think about Google, which holds our emails. You think about telcos, which hold our cell phone information, including who we've spoken to, how long we've spoken to them, and when we've spoken to them. Electrical utilities hold our energy consumption data, which can be a, a, an area of huge interest to marijuana grow up investigators, among others. So the question then becomes, well, what happens when the state goes knocking on their doors for our personal information? We're no longer in a paradigm where the police and the state are simply showing up at our homes and our offices with targeted search warrants. They are going to third party intermediaries. They are going to businesses uh, and commercial organizations which hold our private information uh, and making fairly broad requests for our personal data. So the first uh, decision point really is whether to, for the private organization, whether to insist uh, that law enforcement show up with a court order of some sort or a search warrant. Uh, it is certainly always open to the private organization to take that position that was made clear in the TELUS decision in 2015. Justice uh, Nordheimer uh, made that point. And not only is this uh, a, an option for the private organization, but indeed it may be the safest legal option given the restrictions uh, of PIPEDA, which my colleague Justin is going to talk a little bit more about later. But PIPEDA basically governs what organizations can do with personal information that they collect, use, or disclose in the course of their business. Personal information is very broadly defined, uh, basically to mean any information about an identifiable uh, individual. Now, uh, as with any piece of uh, legislation, there are, of course, carve-outs for and exceptions for when the organization can disclose this information to government without the knowledge or consent of the uh, customer, the individual to whom the information relates. There's one carve out where the law enforcement shows up with the warrant uh, or court order. There's another carve out where law enforcement identifies their lawful authority to obtain. That can be a tricky one because in Spencer, the Supreme Court of Canada said, well, that lawful authority to obtain must include more than a bare request by the police or by law enforcement. And so where that exception may ultimately take you is simply back, in most cases, to the warrants uh, or court order requirement. And for that reason, uh, it may be safer as a legal matter for the organization to simply insist uh, on some sort of production order or search warrant. Question then becomes, well, what types of court orders and what types of search warrants might uh, an organization or business C. Uh, and there's a long, long list of, of, of court orders in the criminal code, not to mention the other statutes uh, that deal more with regulatory investigations. It would take far longer than the 12 minutes I have here to go through all of them. So I'm just going to group them into three broad categories uh, in terms of the types of orders that the police or law enforcement might obtain. The first are orders which require the police to establish nothing more than reasonable suspicion. 
That's the lowest standard short of a random groundless search. Reasonable suspicion, or, or as it's sometimes phrased, reasonable grounds to suspect that the information they're seeking may offer evidence of criminal activity. And that's the legal standard in the criminal code for a number of production orders aimed at metadata, or data about data. Uh, three categories include transmission data, that is metadata about our telecommunications. Tracking data, it's metadata about relating to the location, not just the things, but also to individuals. So if a particular organization has uh, information relating to where you have been uh, in the past, that's an order that the police can get on the basis of reasonable suspicion, uh, as well as financial data. Some think, um, uh, uh, and I might include myself in that uh, group, that this standard is constitutionally questionable. Questionable. It is open to challenge. The reasonable suspicion standard has been upheld traditionally in minimally intrusive searches like dog sniffs, where they're uh, sniffing your uh, luggage or your backpack to determine whether or not there are drugs inside. Uh, far cry, uh, many would argue, from uh, broad production orders aimed at obtaining your metadata. Uh, but until some resourceful defense lawyer gets a hold of the perfect test case, that remains a standard. Uh, on the books. Uh, volunteers are accepted if anyone in the audience uh, wants to subject themselves to that. The, the second category are searches that require police to establish what's normally the default standard for searches and seizures in the criminal law, and that is reasonable grounds to believe, not to suspect, but to believe that evidence or the data they're, they're seeking may offer evidence of criminal uh, activity. And the one that it's most applicable to in this context where we're talking about getting at data in the possession of third party uh, organizations is the general production order. And the general production order is the one that the police have to resort to if they cannot fit the data that they're seeking in one of the more specific uh, production orders that we just talked about. One example can be if they're looking for the contents of communications, not just metadata, but the actual contents of text-based communications, such as email, although even that is now not entirely settled. And that is because uh, there is a case, uh, Ted, which Ted mentioned uh, at the beginning, the Jones case, which is considering whether Part 6 of the Criminal Code, which is the third category I just want to touch on briefly, whether Part 6 ought to apply any time that law enforcement is trying to get access to the contents of our private communications. Part 6 is just a you know, legal uh, a legalese for a wiretapping authorization. It was enacted by Parliament to deal with wiretapping of our phone conversations, which was thought to be so invasive that we needed to really impose a heightened threshold of protection. So not only did the police have to establish reasonable grounds to believe, they have to show what's called investigative necessity. Uh, in other words, that there are no practical alternatives to getting at the uh, information that they want or achieving the investigative objective other than to wiretap. Well, what uh, the Supreme Court considered in 2013 was how does this apply to text messages? And they went as far as to say that if the police are trying to get, in that case from TELUS, to an, order that an order that would require them to produce future text messages, that is text messages that don't yet exist at the time they go to the judge to seek permission, they've got to meet the rigors of part six. What Jones is looking at now is whether that is also going to be true of historical text messages. So if rather than if, if the police go to the judge the day after the messages have been sent, rather than the day before, do they also have to meet the rigors of uh, part six? So we're all waiting anxiously to see what the Supremes do in Jones. Depending on how broadly they write their decision, it may impact not just SMS text messages, but all sorts of text-based communications like emails, WhatsApp messages, you know, who knows what other forms of technology will, will uh, uh, arise by the time they issue their decision. Um, the takeaway effectively from all of this is that Court orders and search warrants when you're dealing with access to digital data can be very complicated uh, in terms of whether the state has, is resorting to the right form of order and meeting the right standard. It gets even more complicated when you throw cross-border investigations into the mix, and, I, and I'll just touch on this briefly. One issue that has arisen that's being hotly litigated now south of the border is what do you do when you are a... Uh, when domestic law enforcement wants access to data that's stored on a server outside of the country. So uh, in the Microsoft case in the United States, the 
federal government wanted access to emails of a user, which Microsoft said, look, we're going to give you the email stored in the, our, the American servers, but we're not giving you email stored in our servers in Ireland. Uh, for that, it's an ex extra territorial order, and we're not, the court uh, did not intend to, uh, or the legislation did not intend to authorize that type of order. Microsoft was successful in resisting the production order on that basis. Google tried similar arguments in different jurisdictions south of the border and had far less success. Uh, and so that is an issue that's probably destined for the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, in Canada, there's not as much case law, although in the eBay case back in 2008, the uh, Canada Revenue did succeed in issuing a production order to eBay, which required them to pull, retrieve data from servers stored outside of Canada in order to uh, comply with the order. Um, final topic I'll just hit briefly is, is what to do if you're an organization and you're interested in contesting one of these orders or warrants, perhaps on the basis that, uh, that they're overly broad or they're, they're, uh, the inappropriate uh, standard was met in, in the circumstances of the case. Uh, the criminal code, of course, has a provision that allows for private organizations, who are the targets of these orders, to seek to vary or revoke the order at an early stage of the process. And if you launch that application, you don't have to comply with the order pending the application. So it, it can be quite a useful tool. And in challenging that order, not only can the organization make statutory or, or common law arguments, uh, but it's, uh, there is now authority for the proposition that they can assert the constitutional rights, the individual constitutional rights of their customers. And that came out in the Rogers Communications case, which was one where the police sought, uh, had a very, very broad sweeping production orders aimed at Rogers. Uh, and tell us, requiring them to produce the records of all sorts of individuals who had had their cell phones communicate with a number of cell towers over a fixed time period. And I think the evidence in that case was it would have required uh, uh, tens of thousands of customers to have their private information uh, divulged to the state. And so in challenging that order and in adjudicating that challenge, the court held, A, the telcos have a right to assert the constitutional rights of their customers, because otherwise it would be utterly impractical to assume that the cust all customers would come forward and assert their own rights, uh, but also B, endorse this principle of minimal intrusion as a constitutional principle, which is that the state, particularly when they're seeking access to data in the hands of third parties, because now you're not just talking about one target, you're talking about potentially thousands of individuals that they're getting information about, particularly in that context, the state must always be alive to the privacy interests that they are potentially infringing and must always work to infringe those interests as little as possible, which means that any production order they seek has to be as narrowly tailored uh, as possible, and it's open to the organizations as a recipient of these orders to challenge it on that basis. That's all for me. Thank you.